Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. Mark's super modest and bashful, so I know he doesn't want to talk about himself, and I'll do it for him. Mark has been serving and ministering in the Edmonton area for the past 15 years. Over half of that has been with the LGBTQ community in some form. Uh, he was hired on a contract position with the United Church as intercultural missioner. His role was to start new ministries with the second and third generation Asian families. That is because, despite all appearances, he is part Asian. Here's a picture of his mom and dad. Just a little aside, of the two of them, one is an immigrant to Canada, and the other has ancestors in Canada who date back to the time of the loyalists. Can you tell which is the immigrant? For most of their lives, people have guessed wrong. It's Mark's mother who had immigrated from England, but her experience as a newcomer is often dismissed because she doesn't look like an immigrant. His dad, on the other hand, whose own father is Canadian-born Chinese and mother is white, will always be asked for the rest of his life, where do you come from, really? I think that speaks to the Canadian biases and assumptions that we make. Oh, okay, okay, Mark, thank you very much, but we don't need to be talking about my family. That's not what this workshop is about. Oh, oh sure, yeah, yeah, sorry. Except... Except it kind of is related. The point of today's workshop is to talk about Canadian biases and assumptions, like assuming the white person in the photo is the real Canadian. Okay, I get your point. But we that was an issue back in the 80s. We've got a really smart group here today. They're very self-aware. Oh yeah, they're all wonderful. I'm sure they've studied racial justice. They don't make mistakes like that. Except except when it comes to sexuality. We make mistakes and assumptions about sexuality all the time, especially with newcomers to Canada. You've made mistakes. Yeah, that's true. See, I know what I'm talking about. By the way, they can tell you don't have pants on. <laughs> so Mark was doing the intercultural missionary work, but when the initial project didn't work out, he looked for other intercultural possibilities. And where do you find a lot of intercultural ministry potential? in the queer and trans communities. It's not a coincidence that the LGBT community is very culturally mixed. Queer uh, Asian American theologian Patrick Chen describes part of queer life simply as being a fluidity between boundaries. We cross boundaries of social, social boundaries in our sexuality, but we cross literal boundaries between countries as well. And then finally, um fluid boundaries, right, that instead of focusing only on the United States, queer color folks are really good about talking about international boundaries, how sexuality and gender identity are fixed things. They actually change as you shift boundaries, right? I mean, look, uh, issues like migration, ministry with the queer and trans communities a very culturally diverse experience and to be successful in it, you need to have a sensitivity to that diversity built into your programming. Mark gathered a team that created a ministry called Haven, and through them we did a lot of work with a wide variety of newcomers to Canada, including some LGBTQ refugee claimants. Later, Mark would partner with the Edmonton Mennonite Centre for Newcomers and a couple other affirming ministries, and we'd start a group called Rainbow Home, a LGBTQ refugee sponsorship team here in Edmonton. Within a year, we've sponsored two separate refugee sponsorships, and both individuals have lived at Mark's home. Speaking of which, in Mark's home, there's five LGBTQ people. Three of them are newcomers to Canada. One has a Métis background. We span cultures from West Africa, Middle East, and Asia. And that doesn't even include his partner of 17 years who's Filipino. But Mark will say this doesn't make him an expert on the LGBTQ newcomer experience. Because it doesn't. I'm not an expert in that. I'm not a newcomer myself. What I have some expertise in is the mistakes and conflicts that arise when Canadians encounter people of different cultures. Some of this is what I've learned having lived it, but I'm also really indebted to the courses I've been taking in my Doctorate of Ministry program. Why don't you tell them about that? Oh yeah, he's doing this little doctorate thingy. So what he's sharing with you today isn't even his own stuff. It comes mostly from two courses he's taken, one with Bernard uh, Schleiger at the Pacific School of Religion, and another with Hugo Cortoro Cuero, who taught queer liberation theologies at Star King. They're really great. You should get them to lead this workshop. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll take it from here.
All right. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. So now that's some of my experience that I've had doing LGBTQ uh, ministry. And I know you have a lot of experience yourselves. So I'm curious to know who's watching and uh, whether or not you happen to be an LGBTQ newcomer to Canada. So I've got that poll question uh, and it should be popping up soon. As other Mark had said, when it comes to doing ministry, the LGBTQ newcomers, I've made plenty of mistakes. I'm still making lots of mistakes. Uh, there's certain assumptions that we make as Canadians, attitudes that we have that are so culturally based that we don't even notice we're making them until there's a conflict or some sort of cultural clash. It's revealed, I believe, most when we ask questions, uh, when we encounter different cultures. So some of those questions would be, first questions uh, we tend to have is, how can anyone say there's no gays in my country? That's ridiculous. Uh, some say, well, if their family won't accept them, why don't they just walk away? And some people ask the question, well, how could a parent ever disown their child for being queer or trans? Don't they love them? Those are questions that I've asked myself as I do this ministry, and I've heard others ask the same thing. And if you're doing a Canadian doing work with LGBTQ newcomers, they might be questions that you've asked yourself. And when we have those questions, we're actually experiencing a culture clash. It's something about their cultural upbringing and perspective that doesn't make sense to our cultural frameworks. For North Americans, sexual or identity and orientation, they're pillars in our fight for queer rights. There's this whole history here that I don't have time to get into. This is the bit I'll cut. It involves Romans 1, the evolution of the term sodomy, and the creation of the word homosexual in 1886. In our fight for queer rights, we worked hard to establish sexual orientation as not a choice. And what we were doing is we were defending ourselves against specifically Romans 1. We needed to show that we were not acting against nature or against God. For us, sexual identity became crucial and is considered immutable. In some other cultures, that your sexual activity doesn't define who you are. You might have sex with someone of the same sex, but that doesn't mean you're queer. And it doesn't take away from your obligations to marry someone of the opposite sex and raise a family. In other societies, as well as our own historically, uh, it was expected that homosexual, homoerotic activity could occur in homosocial settings. So work camps, sailors at sea, cloisters, prisons, all of those places. It wasn't condoned, but people would look the other way. And it could also occur at particular ages. It was okay, sort of, as long as you outgrew it and you got married and had children later on in life. So this is one of the reasons we might hear others say, there are no gays in my country. What they are not saying is that there is no homoerotic activity. What they are saying is that we don't have a culture of sexual identity or individual rights based on sexual orientation. They're saying that this concept of orientation and identity is a Western concept. And gotta say that's a fair critique. What does this mean for ministry with LGBTQ newcomers? Well, it means that you might encounter a higher number of mixed orientation relationships. Gay or lesbian folks who are married to people of a different gender, but having sex with people of the same gender on the down low. We place a lot of judgment on people in that situation. We, as Canadians, accuse them of lying, cheating, hypocrisy, or we take pity on them and imagine that they're filled with self-hatred and fear. But labels of in the closet, hiding, cheating, adultery, none of those quite fit this context. There are a lot of cultural dynamics and pressures at play that we simply don't understand. But getting off of our Canadian high horse is going to be tricky. We Canadians can be very judgy and self-righteous when it comes to sexuality. Or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. We feel like we're more advanced on this and that the rest of the world needs our enlightenment. When it comes to sexuality, we perpetuate attitudes of colonialism.
in the act of colonizing, we exported and imposed our understandings of sexual ethics, uh, especially the British laws on sodomy. So it's really hard to know what a culture was like before European powers ravaged them. In some countries, it can be almost impossible to separate that colonial legacy from their own cultural understandings of sexuality. I'm going to show you a little video to give you an example of this. It's about the Ugandan martyrs. Between 1885 and 1887, a group of 45 Catholic and Anglican Ugandans were executed by the king of Buganda, Kabaka Mwanga II. Now the story goes that these young Christian men were killed because they refused the sexual advances of the king. At the time in Buganda, which is modern day Uganda, there were three factions vying for influence in Mwanga's courts, Catholics, Anglicans, and Muslims. Sex with court pages was a common practice, and it included both male and female pages. Dr. Kenneth Hamilton from Notre Dame de Namur University points out that, for the boys at least, being a page at the royal court was an envious position because they were seen as the future leaders of the kingdom. Mwanga kills a lot of pages, both Christian and Muslim, and there were political factors involved with that. But what's interesting for our discussion is how this event impacts Ugandan identity and opinions on sexuality. This becomes a pivotal event and it grows in influence. Eventually, the pages are venerated as martyrs and become canonized as saints in 1964. There's pilgrimages to the Basilica of the Ugandan Martyrs. There's a university named after them. And their feast day, June 3rd, is a public holiday in Uganda. And this story has an important role in Africanized Christianity across East Africa and even on the other side of the continent in Senegal. But the role that sexuality plays in this story evolves over time. John Levins of Emory University writes that the earliest accounts of this story didn't include the sex bit. Even when they're canonized in the 1960s, the Pope doesn't really mention sex. Kevin Ward, African Studies lecturer at the University of Leeds, says that at the time of Ugandan independence, Mwanga was characterized as an African patriot. And throughout the 70s and 80s, Ward would hear his students speak about Mwanga with more sympathy as someone oppo who opposed colonial powers. It's not until the 1990s that sexual behavior and identity become a larger part of this narrative, and Kapaka Mwanga becomes depicted as a homosexual predator and pedophile. This, even though he had multiple wives and children, so he's at least bisexual if we have to put a label on him. And the pages he killed were either close to his own age or some were older than him, so pedophile doesn't fit either. Why the shift in attitude? Again, it's connected with colonialism. The West moves towards a particular understanding of sexual identity and orientation. And we impose that perspective in our cultural exports, and we enforce it politically in our fight for LGBTQ rights. And that produces a culture clash. We can see a massive colonial Western influence in this Ugandan a martyr's story. It gets refamed as a Saint Pelagius story. It's interesting to note that there is a story of a young Saint uh, Pelagius who was a Christian in Spain and captured by the Moors. He gets executed when he refuses the Caliph's sexual advances. Very similar to the Ugandan story. I imagine that as European missionaries retell this Ugandan event that Saint Pelagius gets mixed up into it. We might be tempted to say, oh, hey, Uganda, are bad. When we occupied your country, we left behind a bit of our homophobia. I'll just take that from you now and toss it out. But if we do that, we're just repeating the mistakes of colonialism, imposing our views on another culture. I love Morito Gorasi and Enzo Chidando, professors from Botswana and Zimbabwe, respectively, talk about how tricky this is. They recognized that a lot of the negative attitudes towards queer and trans people in Africa was left behind by colonialism. But for a Western power to now march in and demand queer rights is also problematic. They write, it is our opinion 
that as long as there is a perception that Africa is being civilized or talked down to, to accept same-sex sexuality, it will remain extremely difficult to make headway in changing attitudes towards same-sex relationships. This is work that African researchers, scholars, and the people themselves need to do. We can be supportive, but we have to be very careful to listen and to take our cues from African LGBTQ activists themselves. And we need to be aware that the ways that African communities talk about sexuality, the methods they use to bring about inclusion of LGBTQ people, and what the end result looks like, might be very different than it looks here in North America. I have a poll question for you. How to help LGBTQ people in Africa is a big debate. Tongarasi and Shetando argue for a slow and behind the scenes empowering of queer and trans Africans, letting them gradually challenge and transform their own societies. Others, though, think that that's too slow. There are people now being imprisoned and killed. So whether it's colonialist or not, they think we should use every tool to demand the protection of queer and trans people. This is, if you're a Star Trek fan, it's kind of a prime directive debate. Do you let society evolve on its own or do you have an obligation to step in when you see injustice? Notice that even me proposing that question is full of er cultural arrogance. Still, I'm, I'm gonna ask it of you. Here you can see it popped up. Uh, would you support LGBTQ African activists behind the scenes, even if that's a slower result? Would you or use your our political and economic power to demand LGBTQ rights now? Or maybe don't know, or maybe there's another way. Now I'm going to take you over to Hong Kong and introduce you to Lai Shan Yip. She's a queer theologian, also was a former student at Pacific School of Religion, and has done a lot of activism in the Catholic community of Hong Kong. She's part of what's called the New Tsonzi movement. Tsonzi means comrade, and it's been a term that's been adopted by the queer community for themselves. She recognizes that the impact of colonialism on Hong Kong's view of sexuality, but at the same time, she finds in her research that the struggles for the new Tongzi community is not between sexuality and faith. Rather, it's the bigger cultural factors at play in Asia. So like Tongarasi and Chitando in Africa, Yip says that we need to work towards LGBTQ rights in Asia with a different approach than is used in North America. In her context, the emphasis needs to be on political activism more generally, instead of focusing on queer activism. In North America, we have very specialized niches of, Africa, of activism. We'll focus on a single issue at a time. So first gay rights, and then maybe lesbian rights, then trans rights, and we'll eventually get to bi rights someday. Yip writes that the queer rights struggle, in her context, needs to be part of a much larger and holistic struggle for human rights. And you can see this being played out with activists in Taiwan. Here's a little clip. Activists from all over Asia come to Jiwei with questions. They want to learn from Taiwan. In other countries, they always get community, lesbian, lesbian community. But in Hanlai, you can see LGBT in the same office. I just come to work and they always ask how. This group came from China. Zhuwei tells them that a big part of Taiwan's success has been working with activists in areas beyond just LGBT rights. Other queer uh, Asian theologians take similar broad perspectives, uh, approaches. Uh, Boon Lin Yeo writes that a Tonzi theology prioritizes interdependence and community rather than autonomy and individualism. We have to act together and we should be comrades of each other. And this is where you start to see what is the major cultural clash at play. Collective rights versus individual rights. In Asian contexts, as it is with many other cultures, the rights of the community and of the family outweigh the rights of the individual. 
North American culture is incredibly individualistic. We often don't realize how much that individualism permeates our worldviews until we clash with another worldview. So just speaking for myself and my Asian relationships, there is enormous pressure, a sense of duty and responsibility to be having children and to continue the family line. And that outweighs the intimate decisions that you will make for your own personal life. Uh, Nyo says that sex in traditional Chinese cultures never had that sense of shame that existed in Western cultures. Your sexual behaviors didn't matter as much as your family relations. So if same-sex sexual activity occurred behind closed doors, well, what did that matter? As long as you were still in an opposite-sex marriage and fulfilling your, your filial duties. So you might not have shame about sex, but you'll have enormous shame about disappointing your family. North Americans, we celebrate the underdog. We make heroes out of those who don't conform. If you rebel against your family, well, we interpret that as you being authentic and strong. That means when we hear that someone is afraid to come out to their family, we end up placing a value judgment on them. We don't mean to, it happens almost subconsciously. Staying in the closet is interpreted by us as a sign of weakness and cowardice. But in a society that places its emphasis on collective rights over individual rights, you're not a hero for rebelling against society, you're just an asshole. Instead, you gain respect when you make, make self-sacrifices for the sake of peace and harmony. Sacrificing your romantic desires and relationships to keep peace in your family shows how strong and compassionate you are. When we place pressure on someone from another culture to come out of the closet, when we push, and I have been guilty of doing this, and say, why don't you come out to your parents? I'm sure they'll accept you, and if you don't, you should just walk away. We brush aside these big cultural differences. It ignores the sacrifices that they are choosing to make for their families. Uh, Carolyn Polisky uh, observed in her work with queer women from newcomer communities in Australia that rather than coming out, a better image for them was inviting in. It's the view that your personal life is private and it's your choice who you invite into that. In other LGBTQ cultures, there's no felt need to be standing on a rooftop and waving your pride flag. But by inviting in instead of coming out, you can maintain the connection and harmony with your communities. And that connection to community is more important than we Canadians give it credit for. We tend to be very Protestant. If your community rejects you, then you should break away and start a new one. Or if your family rejects you, then leave them behind and create, create your own chosen family. That works great for those of us raised with white Canadian Protestant culture. But for the rest of the world, that is both inconceivable and possibly insulting. Your community is part of your identity, religion, ethnicity, family, all of that is woven together. Asking someone to just walk away from their family and or community is like saying, hey, you don't need all of those stitches in your sweater, just pull out a few threads that you like best. Well, what good are those threads if it's not connected to the fabric? Sharon A. Bong, uh, Monash University in Malaysia, interviews queer women in Southeast Asia about the struggles that they go, on, go through holding on to all these threads. For the women she interviewed, it was of utmost importance that peace was maintained that they didn't tear away at the fabric. As Canadians, we need to understand and respect that need for peace. It doesn't mean, however, that things can't change. Bong says that sometimes peace is found by avoiding conflict, but sometimes peace comes through conflict. The pain that the women she interviewed felt proved that there is already a tear in the fabric, a hole in the sweater. Bong honors that disclosing your sexuality to your family she knows will cause pain, but she suggests it has the potential of being the sort of pain that's like sewing a patch or mending the hole. 
North American queer rights movement, our queer theology, our queer theory, all of it is very iconoclastic. We tear down tradition, we question everything. Queer theology is literally about queering, twisting, turning traditional theology and its assumptions. What queer Asian and African theologians show us is that you can have that fight for queer and trans rights without tearing everything down. The goal is not to break away from your family, but to help them all evolve together and to heal and grow together. It means, at times, sacrificing the needs of the individual, and that's the part that we individualistic Canadians often bristle at. We don't, we don't need to agree with that method, but we need to understand that just because someone isn't standing up to their family, just because they're not coming out, just because they're not marching in a pride parade, doesn't mean that they're not participating in the queer movement. They are doing lots of things to change their communities, but probably not in ways that we can see or appreciate because of our cultural lenses. Here's now another poll question. We've been talking about the clash between collective rights and individual rights, and I think this pandemic is the perfect opportunity uh, that we see that playing out right now. And so I'm gonna just give you an option. If I were to buy you a plane ticket and you had to land in either China or Sweden, which country would you land in? China has been very collective in their uh, approach to it. Everyone gets locked down, and that, in Western opinions, tramples on individual rights. Whereas Sweden's tried to stay open, and it's meant that there's a, perhaps a higher death toll. We're not sure at this stage in history which country had the right approach, but which one would you prefer to fly to? The collective one or the individualistic one? Okay, this brings me to the last culture clash question. How can a parent disown their child for being queer and trans? Don't they love them? I hear this one the most, uh, and it actually irks me the most. The short answer is that no parent disowns their child because they stopped loving them. I'm confident of that. Usually the child is disowned because their parents love them and they are convinced that this is the best way to help their child. An exception, of course, to relationships that are abusive, that's a different category. If the parents are religious, particularly if they're Christian, being queer and trans often means to them that the child has abandoned God and is therefore destined to a life of sin and eventual hell. That's the impact of Romans 1. So they'll take this tough love approach in the desperate hope that it will save their child in the long run, or at least save their soul. Now, we can disagree with the tough love approach, please do, but we can't say that those parents aren't loving their child. That doesn't fit. For some, there can be an, also an element of sacrificing yourself for the sake of the common good. From the parent's perspective, their child, in being queer or trans, tore a hole through their lives and they might have other children or grandparents or extended family that they're worried about and that they feel a need to hold all together. So if they accept their queer or trans child, it might mean further disruption to everyone else. So in the parent's mind, they make this painful Abraham and Isaac type of sacrifice to cut off their child in order to protect everything else in order to safeguard their church, in order to protect their faith, in order to contain the spread of homosexuality in society. Not everyone thinks this way, but some might. And I want to be giving you different cultural perspectives. Another poll question. Do you know anyone who has been disowned by their parents because of their sexualities? Maybe that's you yourself or a close loved one or someone else you work with or know in the community. So, if you are in a pastoral conversation with an LGBTQ person, especially a newcomer, and they disclose to you that their parents don't accept them, it might not be as helpful as you think to say, oh, I can't imagine how your parents could do that, how heartless of them. The person that you're talking to might not be saying that my parents don't love me. Instead, what they could be saying is that my parents loved me so much that this is what they did. 
And this is how much I hurt them. This is the shame I brought on my family. Those are different pastoral needs. Again, I don't know if this is what they're saying. Everyone's different. But I am cautioning you that we don't know what the feelings are behind that story until we ask. When it comes to parenting, this is where we also get the most judgy. Uh, we're a little more ready to make moral judgments on different cultures when it comes to how they care for their children. And I am most guilty of that. I'm uh, with the Presbyterian Church in Canada, and right now we are having that debate about the inclusion for LGBTQ people. We were supposed to make a decision about it this summer, but because of the pandemic, that's getting passed uh, till later. And the greatest resistance we have comes from Korean Presbyterians and the other uh, ethnic congregations. Every so often, I get on my social media soapbox and I wag my finger at them and I say, Whoa, well, what about your queer and trans youth in your congregations? And, and I am genuinely concerned about the harm that they are doing for those youth. And then they will retort to me, never directly, of course, that the affirming side is being colonialist and not respecting their cultural differences. And they're right about that. For what I believe is the safety of their children, I am willing to impose my viewpoints. And that is a colonialist stance. All of this is very complicated. And that's what I want to end on. Just saying how complicated it all is. It's important that we have a greater cultural sensitivity when talking about sexuality and when working with LGBTQ newcomers. And it's vital to recognize that the history of colonialism stains our intercultural conversations. And uh, I like uh, Marcella Altus Reed, happens to be my favorite theologian. She's from Argentina. And she says that North Americans, we pop in like tourists on other people's cultures, snapping pictures at those things that are different, but never really pausing to understand or be in dialogue with them. But when we do stop and really see each other, I think those culture clashes can be like the clanging gongs of love in 1 Corinthians. And those moments are filled with the potential for God's spirit. So, thank you for taking the time to participate in this. We have some really great questions. So I'll go one by one and just let me know when you're done. So the first one says, doesn't the narrative of homosexuality as a result of colonialism not apply when one's talking about the anti-LGBTQ traditionalist nations that held their beliefs long before colonialism or even without it? So such as um, examples like Ethiopia, India, Islamic nations and such. Uh, so trying to figure out the full role of colonialism in all of this is always very complicated. Uh, and and there is true that anti-LGBTQ, uh, anti-same-sex attitudes have long continued, but it's a lot more complicated in these, these, these past, uh, and a lot of the history has been lost, so it's very hard for us to say what queer theologians are doing right now, are trying to uh, look and reclaim some of the lost uh, LGBTQ affirming stuff in the past. So just to use Canadian examples, we know within the d Indigenous community how the understanding of Two-Spirit was lost uh, because of colonialism and uh, we're trying to reclaim that. Does that mean that every uh, First Nations tribe was LGBTQ positive and affirming before Europeans came in? Who knows? We Probably not. It's always very diverse. Uh, but even within European history too, uh, there is a lot more diversity than, than we've recognized in the past. So you'd have periods like Florence in the 14th century where you could be very gay and it was okay. Uh, there's other times um, uh, in, in our culture where we did more than just look the other way. It, 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 it existed much more vibrantly. But those historically get, those stories get tromp, trampled down. Do you know a parent who has been disowned by their child? And the follow-up is someone mentioned that the word disowned is a strange word because do we really want to be owned? <laughs> well, true. <laughs> well, 
except culturally. Well, see, that's a very North American individualistic perspective. Yeah, no, I don't want to be owned. But for other cultures, no, I belong to a community and being tied, cut uh, out of that community, cuts out a part of, of who I am. Uh, so yeah, no, I don't want to be owned, but that doesn't mean other people in other cultures don't feel differently. That's complicated. Um, I, I do know parents, uh, queer, queer parents whose children uh, disown them or don't want to introduce them to their grandchildren. Uh, that does happen. Yeah, yeah for sure. If we still have to agree that the unaccepting parents tough love approach is real love, does that not cause a lot of guilt for the child because the child is now hurting someone who loves them? And how can we say that the parent's response is not right if it is driven by love? I, I don't want to say that I'm, I, I, I personally am not defending that tough love stance. Uh, I'm just asking for compassion on those parents and I think we need to recognize that uh, even though I think they're doing something wrong they think they're doing the best thing for their child they think they're doing something right uh, so we can hope to change that and but this is this is where again maybe I side more into into a colonialist uh, judgmental sort of attitudes uh, it's not clear-cut the culture is debate and, and, and discuss and figure things out and things change. Um, yeah. This one's asking, what are your struggles for being more sensitive to cultural issues? What can we read to learn more, to become more sensitized? And a follow-up, someone's also asking, what are some more resources, readings, such? Okay. I, like, I'm, I'm a big know-it-all, so my struggle with engaging other cultures is, is actually listening and, and not assuming they're wrong. <laughs> I start the, with, with that position of I know right. Um, and and like, like I really struggle. I've got uh, friends who plan, or newcomers in Canada, some planning to go back to their countries, uh, marrying and entering a mixed orientation marriage and hiding their sexuality. And it to me just feels so tragic that you've had this moment in Canada where you could be out, you could be uh, what I consider to be free and you're going back to something else. But it's taken me a, a long time to be able to appreciate that there are other needs that this person has that will not be answered in a Canadian context. Uh, there are other demands and those are valid as well. Uh, and, and, and again, different perspectives on what sexuality is. Uh, reading resources, I've got, I can s send it out if you want. If I have a bibliography of what I've just uh, shared with you. So there's those scholars. Uh, the most accessible one is the one that I first showed, Patrick Chen, uh, and he's got several books, he's, he's very good. Uh, and so I would, I would recommend him first. And then if you like, theology stuff. I, I love Marcella Altus Reed uh, and I, I think she she's great at challenging particularly North American cultures and the attitudes we have when we go abroad and try to discern theology from the poor or other cultures. If you believe so strongly that you have access to the truth, wouldn't it be worth it to advocate for the truth regardless if it comes across as colonial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This ties in with, uh, I think, interfaith conversations too. So, like, as a Christian, I believe very strongly in, in this path, this way of Christ. I, I believe Christ is the, the best and easiest way of accessing the divine. Um, and so I, I, I hold on to that truth when I encounter other faiths. Uh, and uh, so in the Presbyterian Church in Canada, as part of our uh, creed, we do have a statement when talking about other faiths that this is what I like most is that it's not that we um, are forcing our opinions on others, but rather that we are beggars uh, who have found bread and showing others where food, food can be found. Uh, so it's more about taking a humble approach to another culture and saying, uh, I see how you are engaging. I have these concerns. This is how we do it. 
Um, but then when you get, so the, the question I had asked you that you all copped out of about um, uh, uh, whether or not you would, uh, the, the Star Trek Prime Directive, do you step into a culture? So I think it gets different when you know someone's life is at stake. And I think that's why uh, I've been doing uh, this Rainbow Home and LGBTQ refugee work. Um, I think uh, in what I'm doing now, I'm trying to find a balance. So I feel that what's happening in these other cultures is wrong. Uh, and so I'm going to work to try to bring people to Canada and keep them safe here. Uh, but hopefully through them and through other things, empowering the activists who are in those countries already. Um, Hi, Mark. Um, I have a question I wanted to ask. You talked about this idea that when we talk with LGBTQ newcomers, sometimes we have the expectation that they will come out to their families or that they have a certain timeline to do so. Mm -hmm. And I think probably many of us, even regardless of how quote unquote new the person is to uh, you know, the culture that we are already in, perhaps have a hard time with the tension between wanting to support them in their journey of coming out to their families and what that all entails. And then also giving them time to make their own decision on whatever that path might mean. So would you have something to share in terms of how to hold that tension? So that way we're not just sort of sitting back and, you know, not trying to be supportive or help them move forward on their journey, but also not imposing our own timelines on them? I, I have terrible answers because <laughs> I, I have a very close loved one uh, who is in exactly that position uh, and, and won't come out to anyone and has, has gone on decades like this uh, and I think happy to continue the rest of their lives. And, and I keep wondering, when's the point where like I, I am very confident that this person will be well accepted by everyone. Uh, there's not a need to be hiding, but they also don't feel the need to be coming out. Uh, so that's why the, the coming out versus inviting in for me was an, an important bit. So it meant for me changing my perspectives and saying, okay, this, this person's actually quite happy. I'm the one thinking that what a sad life that they're having. That's my value judgment. Uh, but they are, yeah, they invite into their lives very close friends and they, they've got a few other family members who know. And I just have to take their word for it that they are happy and content with where their life is at this time. But also reminding them and being present for when that time comes when I can send them the little glad you came out cards. I, I buy those cards and send them out. I've got it all ready for them. Uh, someday I will send it, but in their time frame. Right. I think that that's a really key thing. That's a part of a conversation for a lot of churches working with the folks on anybody's coming out journey, because I think in the media that we consume, and I'm glad that you were able to show some videos of other perspectives, the media that we consume, at least in a North American context, often has a very linear point of view of realization to self-acceptance to coming out. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really interesting to sort of take the linear view out of it and for us to work on it as a being supportive on it, basically a case by case basis. Where is this person at and what is the most loving thing for me to do? Here's a comment. And if you have something to say on it, I've recently met a newcomer who came to Canada to be safe in order to live as they choose quote LGBTQ, but cannot safely mention this choice to anyone back home. They would put people at home at risk and it's not safe. This is where we need, quote unquote, no judgment. Indeed. Uh, and, and a lot who come to Canada so that they can be out, but they can't be out with their, their, anyone from their community. So you, you need to know that, that the cultural community is, is tied with this too. So uh, like the people that we have sponsored and, and welcomed here, uh, uh, in, in their cases, they don't want to meet anyone from their own cultures. Um, all of that that's tied together uh, and, and there is great sincere fear that if one person from their culture finds out that it will make its way back home somehow. Um, so the, just because they're here and they're out doesn't mean all those fears and, and, and stuff have left them. They still live with that. 
I find that as well when it's a less individualistic culture and more of a collective culture where some of mm -hmm. us might not have that fear, um, mm -hmm. but other more interconnected communities. You talked about your past and your history a little bit, but why do you think you're compelled to learn more and explore this topic and obviously share it with people like us? Like, why does that feel really important to you personally? Um, because I know it's something that I have been bad at. So, so though those places where you've stumbled a bit, that's, that's probably where someone else could learn to. Uh, and, and just the, the work that I had been doing in, in preparing for this doctorate process, uh, has introduced me to a lot of other theologians and, and thoughts and perspectives from outside of North America that I hadn't heard before when I was going through, through ministry. Um, and that, that kind of really opened my eyes. Uh, so like I've been doing lots of work with LGBTQ newcomer communities, uh, but that doesn't mean everything that I was doing was actually good. <laughs> and so I have learned a lot and, and, and had a much more humble approach now. And I, I think it comes out of mostly living with a lot of, of newcomers and, and that support. Uh, I think when you are like cooking in the same kitchen and getting under your, each other's feet in a pandemic, you learn where, where the tensions are. I know you talked about, a lot about, you know, learning and um, trying to find resources into helping with um, accepting newcomers and trying to f figure out how to help them with the coming out process or living here um, as LGBTQ. Is there any, like, tangible ways we can help? Like, is there any way we can like offer money? Is there any way we can like, you know, maybe volunteer with Rainbow Home? I know I've done a few fundraisers in the past for that. Um, maybe for money. any of the audience. Yeah, yeah, give us money. Uh, uh, we, we are always collecting uh, for the next uh, refugee. Uh, we'll probably take a little bit of a break. Uh, it is a lot of work sponsoring, um, but we have now established a presence in Edmonton. People know that they can be coming here and they have support. So we do want to be welcoming uh, more, more individuals. Um, one thing, if you're in the Edmonton area, we need volunteers for that because we're, we're getting tired. So if you get just, all we need is a group of, of at least five individuals uh, who would work together to, to be that sponsorship team. And we have the funding and the knowledge to be able to back you up in that. Uh, and if you, so if you want to, to donate, uh, one way of doing it oh, is going to my own, um, well, donating to Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers and putting a note on that, that's for the LGBTQ Refugee Fund, or through my own congregation, uh, our, our, we're St. Andrew's Presbyterian in Edmonton. Uh, you can use our Canada Helps and just put a note that it's for the LGBTQ Refugee Fund. Yes. Can I talk about sodomy? Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> Can I do sodomy in four minutes? So this is the bit that I, one of the bits that I had to cut out. Uh, and it's, it's how come like we have as North, North Americans, this particular understanding of uh, sexual identity, right? Uh, and that is related to Romans 1 and the evolution of the term sodomy. So sodomy um, was at one point just a sexual activity. So it's something heterosexuals did too. And so the, there's these books of penance and the punishment that uh, the monks would write down for sodomy. Uh, it would be equal to some other minor crimes. It wasn't seen as a big thing. Uh, but over time, uh, sodomy gets more and more tied with the idea of heresy and that you are abandoning God. Uh, and and then it gets used as a way of attack. So there's uh, Peter Damien writes this book of Gomorrah and he sends it to the Pope and he goes on, he documents about how all these monasteries, all these men, they're just, you know, they're all buggering each other, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and the Pope kind of ignores it, which is uh, a sign that well, a lot of uh, homoerotic activity was happening and uh, people were looking the other way. Uh, but then increasingly it's used in attacks to other cultures. This culture is is uh, 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 evil because of gay activity. And Martin Luther uses it a lot against Catholics. Uh, and so now sodomy is not just 
a thing that you might have done, but becomes an identity. You are a sodomite. Uh, and then if you have done any sort of same-sex sexual activity, well, that stained you and made you uh, permanently a heretic and a sodomite. And therefore, to contain that heresy, so theology and, and sexuality, it's all tied together here. To contain that heresy, you needed to be burned. It was for the sake of the whole community. Uh, and it's later in 1886 that the term sodomite, well, that was seen as a bit uh, 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 judgmental, gets changed to the more clinical term of homosexual. Uh, and it was changed by a man in Hungary who was in him, himself in the closet. Um, but still, now that you have the term homosexual, you've now uh, established clearly that sexuality is an identity. Uh, and so that's a different tract than other cultures take in their history with sexuality. You did amazing. And, you know, for all of our 84 attendees, when else do you get like a three minute summary on sodomy at a conference? I mean, yeah, you're welcome. Mark, we had so many comments of people saying uh, that they really enjoyed your session and that it was phenomenal. And we hope to continue to work with you again, because I know that this is just one of the many areas of passion for you. Did you have one last thing it seems like you want to say? Oh, I was just going to say about sodomy, if you want to read more about it, it's the uh, theologian Mark D. Jordan. Uh, he wrote about it.